start, it's indicated in the introduction there, but my granddaughter noticed a scar on my leg and, uh -huh. and she said, what's that, Gramp? And I said, oh, that's where I was hit when I was a soldier in, in the battle. She says, oh, you were in a battle? <laughs> yeah, Nine-year-old honesty. Yes. Anyway, she uh, got me started because I have a log, which is, I kept, like, it's a daily record of all the time I was in, in prison. Uh-huh. And uh, so I brought that out to show her, and she says, but Gramps, I can't read it. <laughs> you know, between my writing and 50-some-year-old right. 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 pencil on very shiny paper, it mm -hmm. was understandable. So I got the idea, gee, it would be good maybe if I typed this up so she could read it. So that's how it all got started. Well, that, good for her, good for her. But the most interesting aspect has been finding uh, the guys that I was captured with are their surviving relatives. Mm -hmm. And in fact, as late as just this past January, I found my closest friend, or I found his family. He, he died in 1971. Oh, so it's been an interesting path. There were actually 18 of us in this building where we were captured. And there were two killed and all but three of the group were wounded, so it was, we were a mess. And uh, so it's been a very interesting path. In fact, I saw a couple of these guys, one for the first time in 57 years, mm -hmm. just uh, a whole month ago. I went to uh, what they call a Tri-State 34th Division Annual Reunion. Mm -hmm. I guess this was their 27th or something. And I've never done one of those before. <laughs> I haven't really been a joiner. In fact, I didn't even know until about a year and a half ago that there was an association. Really? And there's associations for everything. Oh, gosh. Yes. <laughs> so I should have realized it. But it was, it was interesting, and I well, enjoyed it. Uh, you, spent, you really spent most of your life, uh, you know, after the war, you, you got married, you had yeah, your well, life, you had your job, right. family. That now it's time to... Thing. Well, it's been interesting because there have been a lot of offshoots. Mm -hmm. from writing this, and uh, not only my rethinking it in, in many ways, but the whole idea of, oh, there's other people out there that, that would be interested in this, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the surviving family members, their husbands or fathers or uncles or whatever, great-grandfather in one case, just didn't talk much about yeah. the situation, as I guess most of us did. Mm -hmm. And so they've really enjoyed this aspect of looking into uh, a bit of their relatives' lives that they didn't have a mm -hmm. look-see yet before. Mm -hmm. So that, that aspect's been really great. Very good. Well, let's see. We're going to... Um, well, that's half the interview right there. Right. <laughs> Well, now we're going to get into the more formal, although that's not particularly formal aspect. Um, what I'm going to do, first of all, is just basically announce who we are, and then we're going to start off where you're born, and we'll just take it from there. Okay. Okay. Because there's a bit of history in that as to where I was born. Oh. Uh, today we're interviewing Mr. Robert C. Jackson at uh, Latham headquarters. Uh, it is August 8, 2001. Michael Lakey interviewer, Wayne Clark videographer. Uh, Mr. Jackson, where were you born? Groton, New York. Groton, New York. Actually, technically, West Groton, New York. Where's Groton, New York? Well, it's the central part of the state, if you know where Cortland is. Yes. So that's the closest large place, and Ithaca is about 17 miles from there. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> and uh, you went to school in Groton? No. No? I went to a one room country school on Cobb Street in West Groton. In West Groton. Yeah. Eight grades in one building. What was that experience like? Oh, that was interesting because actually uh, it was boarding on our property. And uh, so I, you know, walked to school, although we didn't have buses. So that, uh, but the one room grade eight grade school is, is a unique experience. Mm -hmm. Having become an educator, I often reflected on those days when there'd be three in a class or that sort of thing, and you'd all be in the same room with one teacher, mm -hmm. and the big pot belly stove in the corner that heated the place, 
no electricity, no running water. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, the good old days, I guess. <laughs> but actually, I, you know, being a kid, I probably didn't appreciate it as much as the experience offered. Because actually, some kids, that was like an ungritted classroom in many ways. Because mm -hmm. kids could advance just by listening to other grades above them. And mm -hmm. so, you know, some kids that were real smart, that wasn't me, but some kids that were real smart could actually pick up and move ahead uh, mm -hmm. without anybody even kind of being aware of it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you went through all eight? No, yeah. I moved to Ith Ithaca, New York uh, after my father died and uh, started down there in an elementary school and went to junior high there. Then I moved to Morrisville, New York, which is mm -hmm. up near, near Syracuse. Right. And uh, I graduated from high school there. What year did you graduate from high school? 19, hmm, that's a good question, 1943. 1943. Where, crack in my mind. <laughs> Go ahead. Where were you, um, do you remember when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, not that day. I don't remember where I was or what I was doing, mm -hmm. actually. What time? So. And uh, as the war began, you were still in school. Uh, did you begin yeah, to I was think still, about... Uh, yeah, everybody did, of course. Uh, I volunteered, but I would have probably been drafted, mm -hmm. you know, in short order anyway. And uh, I finished, uh, of course, school in June, and then I actually went in in October. And I was actually my first active day, I guess it was October 1st. And uh, so you, um, you enlisted in Syracuse? Actually, uh, that's the first really assembly point. Right. They got a group of us together prior to that, but then we went to bus to Syracuse. And from Syracuse, by train to Long Island to Camp Upton. Is this your first time away from home? No. Uh, Basically, but I had done traveling some okay. on my own. What was, way. what was Camp Upton like? <laughs> like a lot of other camps, I, my great career in the Army started out with a big bust. I was threatened with court-martial the third day I was in the service. Well, how did that Mis all come mistaken about? Mistaken identity. Oh. I had that with a whole chapter on it <laughs> in the log. Mm -hmm. So that... Uh, but I had my service record at least four times while I was in, I know, was lost. And any time that happened and your group shipped out or moved, you wouldn't go because you had to go through the shops again mm -hmm. and had to get all the paperwork caught up and then you'd catch up with your group. This happened to me several times and after a while it got to be a joke. <laughs> They'd post the, the orders for people moving and I wouldn't be on it. So then the guys would start saying, well, Jackson, take care of the barracks, be nice to the NCOs, <laughs> we'll see you maybe. <laughs> so that's the way that went. It got to be, the, I know of at least four occasions where my service record was lost and you'd get shots all over again. And it wasn't bad because, just the nuisance of it, because you already had them, so you didn't react much. Mm -hmm. But uh, it wasn't much fun. What was basic like for you? I don't know, I was a young kid. I kind of was a challenge. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never, I just kind of did what I was supposed to do. I, probably the biggest thing about my military so-called career is that I was just an ordinary guy like thousands of them. Mm -hmm. And I was no different than, than a you know, whole lot of people mm -hmm. in the same boat. So that's probably, if my career was unique, it's because it's like everybody else's. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, after uh, basic, uh, let's see, were you, you became an infantryman? Yeah, I actually was classified as a veterinary technician because I, uh, my stepfather was a veterinary and I'd worked for years with him and I really liked that. So when you did your MOS classification test, you know, you kind of lean mm -hmm. a certain way. And so I came out classified as a veterinary technician which is what I hoped I'd be assigned to do, mm -hmm. because that's what I wanted to be right. at that point. So anyway, uh, I, they didn't need veterinary technicians, they need, you know, foot soldiers. In fact, in prison camp, we had a guy that 
that spoke seven languages. He'd been an interrogator at Ellis Island. Here he is carrying a rifle. And he's not was not a young guy. He was mm -hmm. in his 30s. Hmm. In fact, he shouldn't have been there technically by age. But, but you know, those situations happen. They mm -hmm. just needed the cannon fodder rather than just... What unit were you assigned to? I was in the 34th Division, 168th Regiment, F Company. And it was an old, in fact, it was the first division overseas and landed in Algiers initially, mm -hmm. fought their way through uh, Africa, and then ended up at Salerno, then Italy. Did you come in as a replacement? Yeah, I came well in as a replacement. What, uh, what was it like at that point to come in as a replacement? Well, in, in the platoon and the company. You, first of all, you, all of a sudden, you're where shells are bursting, you know, where there's previously just been trucks backfiring and that kind of noise. Mm -hmm. Except when you're training, of course, you go through some of that. But we were, I can remember joining the company, we joined them in a vineyard. These guys were dug in and there were rows of grapevines all around us. And, uh, you know, at first you're ducking on the outgoing as well as the incoming because you don't, you know, mm -hmm. don't even know the difference at that point. And uh, pr pretty soon you learn. And uh, I was well received. Those guys are always glad to see more help. Mm -hmm. was, you know, you're welcome no matter how, what you look like or what you were. It was, it was a common thing just to be glad to have help. What was your squad like? We had a good squad, and we had an outstanding company commander. He was Hawaiian by nationality and a great leader. He'd been with the company a long, long time. And our the lieutenant that was captured when I was, our platoon uh, lieutenant, was a uh, really nice guy. He was almost as young as the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, in fact, his widow I have been in correspondence with, he just died four years ago, so mm -hmm. I should have started my story sooner mm -hmm. <laughs> and search. The, um what was your job in the squad? Just a regular infantry? Well, just a rifle? rifle guy, and I carried a radio, and I also occasionally was the first scout, which, no, no, well, I had a friend that liked that, but uh, most people don't care to be first scout. Well, what, what, what did the first scout do? He's out there ahead of everybody, you know, he's leading the whole squad, and platoon, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and uh, he's first man out. Usually, Quite often you use a first and second scout and they work together. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, night patrols, it's scary, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> to say the least. What kind of equipment were you carrying? I, uh, he, uh, this buddy of mine used to carry a Tommy gun because he was off, most time he would be for a scout. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that I just found the family out in January. But uh, the rest of us would I could have had a Tommy gun because I had the radio part-time. It's a small radio, not the big backpack. Oh, I hauled that a couple times, too. But uh, usually it was a, like what you'd call a walkie-talkie. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was on a squad level. Each squad would have one of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, I, I liked the M1, and I didn't want to give it up. Equipment pretty good in general? Excellent. I, you know time I got in, and they weren't using, you know, broomsticks or drill or anymore. Mm -hmm. but, so we, you know, and, and the Enfield rifle had been faded out, too. Mm -hmm. I handled one of those a few times, but never really seriously trained with one, because we were issued M1. Did your training uh, prepare you at all for the... Well, you know, I'm amazed. Of course, I went in in fairly good shape right out of high school. Mm -hmm. Not like the shape I'm in now, but uh, I... Uh, you did get conditioned, because I remember sleeping on, on a bivouac one night for, you know, water froze in our canteen, not hard, just crystallite. It was that cold, and yet you'd sleep through that even though you were miserable. You'd still, and I didn't end up with a cold or anything, <laughs> like I seemed to when I was got to be a civilian. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so you end up in, you're plopped in a vineyard in uh, Italy. Yeah. Uh, what were your first, do you remember your first impressions? Well, I didn't know whether to duck or stand. Uh, that was kind of embarrassing after you realized, hey, that was outgoing, not incoming, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But you got acquainted, you got with your squad right away. And, you know, it's not a social gathering because you can't, staying spread out because of the conditions. So, but eventually as you, you know, spend more and more time and are challenged more and more, you get to know the other people in the squad pretty well. Mm -hmm. The group we were captured with was kind of a mixed bag because it had been a miserable cold rainy day and night previously. And we had captured this house and barn, which is a common unit. And uh, so a lot of guys came up, and we had water source there too. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys came up to to check us out, as they say. And actually, it was to get out of the weather mostly. Mm -hmm. So we had a mixed bag, not just our squad. From the platoon, as, as I've summarized in the book, I hadn't really realized it until I started putting this together. Hey, a lot of these guys I really didn't even know before. Hmm. And <coughs> so that's the way it went. What was your uh, first uh, experience in combat like? Scary. In fact, I think every experience in combat was scary. I, you know, anybody that says they weren't scared or that sort of thing, I'd, I'd have to question their sanity or, or their honesty, one of the two. Mm -hmm. Because, I, you know, your life's in danger and maybe if you don't care about life, you could look at it that way. Mm -hmm. But. I don't remember the first instance. I know it was, you know, shortly after I joined the company that we were on attack again. And that's always when you're exposed more when you're moving. So you're mainly on the offensive? Yeah. Uh, our company was, uh, we were at that point on the, oh, let's see, East Coast. Mm -hmm. No, excuse me, West Coast, I'm sorry. West Coast of uh, Italy. Mm -hmm. Not inland very far and uh, that attack took us you know north up until finally without with only one break took us up to within sight of the leaning tower of pisa on that side then we were pulled back to a kind of resort area on the coast and that was oh a week or so and in that, some of us got special training, and supposedly volunteered, but it was, <laughs> it was you and you and you. And uh, I got tabbed for heavy, heavy demolition work, or learned to set pole charges and mm -hmm. that kind of fun stuff. Bangor torpedoes and that kind of fun thing. <laughs> and thank God I never had a chance to use it after that. But anyway, <coughs> then they pulled us back and we went over to the central part of Italy and they took us on trucks up to near Florence. And from there we attacked north, and I was captured about, I don't know, eight miles or so, I'm not sure, south of Bologna, mm -hmm. in the mountains. And uh, in fact, we had fought so much in the mountains, I didn't, I didn't know there was any level place in Italy at all. <laughs> Although, beyond where I was captured, beyond Bologna, there's a Po Valley prior, you know, to the northern part of Italy. So, you know, <laughs> all in all, it was an interesting experience. Now, uh, take us through the day you were captured. Uh, well, you said it was raining. Yeah, we, it was a dawn attack. In fact, you know, we assembled and started moving out before daylight. And as we approached this small town, I don't know, even know the name of it. On the left and above the town on a ridge was a farmhouse. And so our squad was designated to uh, clear the farmhouse. <laughs> and then the company orders, as I recall from my log, had been to secure the town and the high ground in front of it. And that was supposed to be that day's assignment. Mm -hmm. and of course, those marching orders, as we call them, always sounded so simple and so easy. <laughs> but anyway, 
we finally cleared the farmhouse and uh, set up outpost and started checking. Part of this farmhouse roof had been blown off prior to our even being there. <coughs> and it was still raining and misting and the fog and stuff was still around, so it was hard to see. <coughs> we noticed some activity on our right front and we didn't know what it was and so we <coughs> contacted our company which was you know a couple hundred yards or more behind us and so they said they'd try to find out and this went on and finally they party started using mortars on us so we had to pull our outpost people in because we had a couple direct hits out there and uh, so our lieutenant sent me back to, because uh, we were having some communication problems. Our radios weren't working mm -hmm. too well under the geographic conditions like that. So he sent me back and told me, and he called back for a uh, heavy uh, 50 caliber so tripod mounted water cooled machine gun. And so I brought that group back up with me. And we also dragged up a a wire unit, which is like telephone line, mm -hmm. and uh, so if we had any problems, we had direct wire contact, which is always more secure and, and more uh, dependable. Well, this was, as I said, early in the morning, and the time I went back was maybe mid-morning or somewhere around there, and this while I was gone, they established that it was Germans out front, not some other company, because it isn't unusual for a company to flank you and you're not being aware that they're, mm -hmm. they're friends instead of enemies. But these were definitely not friends. And so we had called artillery way deep, because you don't want it short rounds to fall on yourself, so you start deep and bring them back. And we started that, and then they started shelling us. So it was like, almost like a game. If we didn't call for artillery, we didn't get shelled. But it, it was like retaliation almost. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's crazy. War is a stupid thing anyway. But that, those situations where if you fire at me, I'll fire at you. If you don't fire at me, I don't fire at you. Just you wouldn't think it could exist, but it did. And so anyway, this went on. And, we had a lot of casualties off and on. Uh, ended up with two being killed right there in the house and others outside. But uh, this fire, <laughs> this game, so-called, went on up until late afternoon. And then, it, again, we couldn't figure out why our company wasn't sending up reserves and, and giving us a little more help. So, but we kept going, we kept covering our firing lines and, and all of a sudden we couldn't hear the 50 caliber uh, machine gun. A water cooled 50 caliber machine gun sounds different than a regular machine gun. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't hear it. So somebody checked because we had put these guys in the second story and they had a good field of fire because that side of the house had been blown off. The gun was still there with no men. So they had <laughs> gone somewhere anyway. Uh, we had lost the sound power we got off the wire phone. Had either been caught or, you know, hit by a shell or something. But we had lost that service, so we had no contact with our company. Our little handy talkies were useless. We had two of them and, and couldn't get either one to work. So we didn't know what was going on with the company. And so the lieutenant was just about to assemble us to go out to the back and go back to company. But they found, we found out we were surra surrounded. We couldn't, there were troops between us and, and our company. So we had a firefight for oh, quite a while. They finally got us with what they call uh, their German rifle grenades. They're bigger than a 50 caliber shell, but they fit on the end of the rifle and they're very accurate. Hmm. And they were popping those through those windows and doors. And they're not a highly uh, damaging in ter 
terms of explosive power, but there's a lot of shrapnel. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, if you get hit with one, it would do you in well. Anyway, those things are hitting in there pretty regularly, and we were getting cut up pretty bad. So finally, we had a medic that had, later I discovered, he had seven major wounds. I don't know how he was still alive, but he, uh, all of a sudden he started crawling out, trying to raise one arm and calling comrade, comrade, and they didn't shoot him, so we, because they, somebody had stuck a pair of long johns out a window on, on the end of a shovel handle, and they shot it off. So we didn't expect they were going to allow us to, you know, surrender, but they didn't shoot him, so pretty soon everybody was piling out of there. Later on, some of the guys claimed, oh, I didn't want to surrender, I want to continue to fight. Well, <laughs> BS, that was... That was all I could say to that. So how many were left in the platoon at that point? Well, we had 16 of us live that were captured. We left, that two were killed that we had to leave there. And uh, all but three, maybe four, but I think it was three, were wounded to that group. Some seriously and some minor ones. Mine was minor, I think. Mm -hmm. In fact, I didn't even know I was wounded until we went through a stream later on. Because everybody looked like they were wounded because of other people's blood. Because right. You'd check each other, you'd help each other and stuff like that. And so we, were, we looked a mess, although you might not even be wounded and still look pretty bad. So what was your initial impression? You, you finally decided? Okay. Well, I finally decided. It just was spontaneous. Okay. Uh, I don't think anybody said, let's surrender. There was talk about it, but no one, you know, until that medic went out and didn't get shot. I think that was a clue, then we all dropped our cartridge belts and put down our rifles and went out. What was the initial reception? Very good. Uh, you know, I, I, we didn't know where we couldn't be shot right there. Sure. And, and you weren't sure of that even after you got outside. And, that, and uh, the first guy that searched me, I had left my backpack and everything in the house, which had my camera. I'm a photographer. And I, you know, it wouldn't have done any good because I really would have taken it anyway, but I wished I had the film with it in the film, or had sent it back before or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it didn't. So they uh, searched us, and the first guys I started to say search me, and I had like six packs or five packs of gum in my pocket. He took one and handed me back the rest. Well, you know, that was the last time that happened. The next guy <laughs> searched me, took everything. So, but. Those guys were soldiers, and they knew we were. And we found in prison camp the same thing was true. When we got a guard that had been on the front lines, and we did sometimes because they were home on recuperation leaves mm -hmm. or something, <coughs> those guys really treated us well. I mean, they were with respect and no abuse, thing like that. Whereas the further back we got, with the rear echelon, the less respect you got and the more crap happened. So you were captured by regular Wehrmacht infantry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I for, I don't, you know, obviously don't know what particular unit. Mm -hmm. But uh, as we were walking back, a really a funny thing, no one laughed, but it really was I reflect on it. German stuck his head up out of a foxhole and said to me, and like he was a, another one of us, the shoe's on the other foot now, isn't it? But, you know, in slang terms like that, and in English, <laughs> so, you know, he'd probably been in the state somewhere and maybe lived there, who knows? Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, we, I realized as we were moving back why our company probably didn't count it that. German strength there was unreal. And there were pill boxes, and uh, we knew there was at least one because the shell had knocked off the hay that had covered it. Mm -hmm. But there was a heavily fortified area. I had a friend that I had trained with all through basic training. His name is Robert C. Jager. Mine is Robert C. Jackson. Bunks next to each other. He was captured about five, six months, about five and a half or six months after I was. They had moved about a mile from where I was captured. They had dug in and 
that had been in that area all winter. I've heard all kinds of stories as to why. Lack of supplies, lack of troops, wanted to hold the Germans, didn't want to break through and then have the Germans pull their forces back and consolidate them. They wanted to keep as many Germans tied up there as possible, which you know about. I'm just a GI, I don't know from anything. But, uh, it, it, you know, they were there all winter in that, those mountain ridges. Now they marched you back. Where, uh, to where? Well, we went back to uh, just a, like an aid station, which uh, actually we had grabbed both our medics' kits, which are mm -hmm. small units, thank good. And we had better supplies than those kits than they had in this aid station. So we were, you know, patching up everybody, and, and they took at that point the most severely wounded and put them on trucks. And we had one guy that had a really bad wound in his leg, and he didn't tell anybody. I mean, tell the Germans, because he didn't want to get them on his truck. They didn't know where they were going. And uh, but they did take those people. I, we all hoped to a hospital. I had no way of of knowing, uh, because I, there are three people I haven't been able to find on my search. Mm -hmm. Treatment but, was pretty good up Yeah, that up to that point, we were being hustled and we were being shelled by our own, own fire, you know, and uh, we we're caring because so many were hurt. It was odd. Everybody that could was helping somebody else. <clears throat> and every time a sh shells would come, you'd hit the dirt and the poor wounded people would, you know, take abuse again, but they went down too, they knew they had mm -hmm. to. So that, and it was muddy and it was slippery and, you know, it was a bad situation. But we walked about six miles, estimating, before uh, we got to a point where we were able to sit down and uh, get some uh, water to drink and uh, kind of get organized and so forth. And eventually we ended up, uh, I can't remember the town now. They had a, an assembly point. I mean, we were in a couple buildings and kept overnight mm -hmm. until we got to this assembly point. But uh, from there, they had assembled other uh, nationalities that have been we met some Aussies there, and uh, then we were put on a train at that point and eventually taken to Germany. Had you been interrogated at all up Oh, yeah, point? yeah, the first night. What was that like? Well, it was threatening. It was, you know, a table like this one and a Luger laying on the corner of it and two, a guard at the door and you're sitting there in a straight chair and you ask your name, and you're telling your name, rank, and serial number, and then try to play the role. But it, it's pretty easy to say, well, don't tell them anything. You know? mm -hmm. But I've recited all that in there. That's a, another chapter, mm -hmm. the interrogation. Mm -hmm. But it was intimidating. There's <laughs> no two ways about it. Of course, we hadn't had any sleep, and we'd been, you know, physically under stress for a long time, so that adds all to the sure to the mix. So you're taken to Germany? Um, boxcars. Boxcars. Yeah. So many in a boxcar, you couldn't all sit down at once, let alone lie down. No one could lie down. So you took turns. And under those conditions, it's amazing. People really work pretty well together. And uh, that was a three-day hell, actually, because we had we didn't get water for 29, or anything for 29 hours. And uh, whenever there'd be a raid on the airline, we'd be shuttled to the side and just sweat it out in those boxcars. But that, we had that happen to us later on as we were taken into Munich to work on the railroads and stuff. Mm -hmm. That, you, know, you always hoped you were in town where at least you might get into a shelter. So that was always kind of scary because they were bombing the rail yards, obviously, that was right. the main target. And they had no way of knowing whether it was POWs in those cars or mm -hmm. what. 
So, uh, your first impression of your the first prison camp you were in? Oh, it was a huge one. It was Salik 7A, it was near Munich, mm -hmm. actually about 32 kilometers north of Munich, a small town called Moosburg. It was the lar one of the largest camps in Germany, if not the largest. They figured there were, when we were liberated, there were 80,000 in the camp. And there had been more than that process, process through there. Mm -hmm. They were on what they called commandos. They would be out in other areas, farms, uh, small towns where they had some industry, and they would be working in those places. Hmm. Some were on individual commandos. They were assigned to a farmer, and they worked at a fellow that I met after we were liberated. They had been out, and he had had high school German. He spoke German like a German because he had been with his family and had this high school background hmm. and some basic things, and, but he picked it up real fast. And they didn't speak English, so language was German. And he, you know, became quite fluent. Of. What type of uh, housing did you have in the camp? Well, there were the, varied within the camp, but j basically there were long buildings with uh, a center area that had usually two water faucets, and there were about 200 men on each side, and they were in uh, three-tier bunks, like uh, mm -hmm. they were just made out of two by fours or two by sixes. And in some they had slats, like bed slats. Mm -hmm. And you had a bag of excelsior, uh, like gunny sack material. <clears throat> and others had just wire, which was about six inches each way. And <laughs> your hip could fit right into that sometime. <laughs> but, uh, and we originally, originally issued two blankets, and that was it. And the Excelsior, of course, got loaded with bed bugs and lice. And the big difficulty, if you were cold and uncomfortable, bed bugs and lice weren't so bad. But the minute you got warmed up and comfortable, they got active. And so sometimes it was a real battle. And if you're on a lower bunk, as I was for a while, I remember going to the bathroom one night 16 times. The cold, damp of the bottom bunk. It really had a bad effect on my kidneys. <laughs> but uh, they were three high, two wide, and two tiers deep. We call them tiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a whole series of these down one side. And then they had a kind of a room where the person that was in charge of the barracks was. And then they had an open kind of area with a couple tables and half a dozen or maybe a dozen, I'm not sure, stools, and then more bunks on that. On that. And they had just some light bulbs hanging, bare bulbs, and of course there were not many in the whole thing. But there were about 400 in each of these buildings. How, how were they, or now, how were the, uh, the buildings organized? There were, we were all uh, kept in nationalities, in other words, Russians had their compounds, the Aussies had theirs, and there were hundreds of nationalities there. You know, it just boggles your mind when you stop to think. Mm -hmm. Indian, there was an Indian compound. I guess you could get around camp from compound to compound by bribing the gate guards. And it, it varied, because gate guards are like anybody else. There's good and there's bad and there's tough and there's not so tough. And <coughs> so sometimes it costs you more cigarettes than another time. <coughs> Excuse me just a second. We're going to change uh, tapes. Would you care for some? Uh, we're, you, you're just describing um, the uh, organization of the, the barracks. Um, they're organized by nationalities, but there must be some, was there a hierarchy within? Well, there was always a barracks uh, commander, so okay. called, that could be a person. It wasn't an officer necessarily. In fact, I don't think that were. We had, the officers were segregated from us. And, uh, but we had, I had a couple of friends that were officers 
that had traded identities with GIs because the officers weren't allowed to leave camp for any reason, whereas we were sent out and work details on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends was called Ace Langberg, and he, he was kind of an adventuresome sort of guy. And he would go out just to make plans to escape. In fact, he tried to escape four times. But, uh, and the other person, Tony, did escape. Uh, and I have never been able to find him, but he did escape, uh, as at least Tony t told her. Ace told me Tony had not escaped. Because mm -hmm. I did see Ace uh, after the war. Mm -hmm. But generally, officers were kept in another section of camp. And uh, mostly the people in Stalag 7A initially were foot soldiers and such. Uh, Air Corps were kept in Air Corps prison camp. But as the war squeezed from the east and allies from other directions, they kept moving these people out of those camps. And because we were in the southern part of Germany, the last part of Germany to be captured, this camp, we got so big you couldn't even get in a latrine at the end. Hmm. It was just horrendous. They had tents and they had people sleeping outdoors. Of course, it was the spring of the year, so it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Well, we had the, one of the coldest winters uh, I've since heard in Germany. The, the year I was a prisoner that they ever had. In fact, I have frosted feet and a lot of other people do. What's a, what's a daily routine? Daily routine, if you're on work, you'd get up 5 o'clock or 4.30, somewhere around there. They'd rush you out. They'd come and bang on the doors and open the doors and tell us to get out. And if we didn't, then when you delayed too much, they sent the dogs in. So that emptied the barracks in a hurry. Out the windows and every place. But uh, we would get eat breakfast, what rule we had. They usually bring in like, it's called an ersatz tea. I don't know what the heck it was. But you could, it was, the only thing good about it was warm. Mm -hmm. And lots of times, after we'd leave somebody to wash their feet in and stuff, it wasn't, wasn't that good. And then you'd leave. And you'd march to the train station, five abreast, everything German march and five. And, they, and the joke is they can't, they can count because of how many fingers they have in one hand. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Anyway, we would, uh, get in these boxcars and go to Munich. Sometimes the other direction is the Landschaft, which is a smaller place that was further north. Both rail centers, Munich being the larger, of course, uh, and that's you know, mainly what we did. We sometimes worked on civilian areas, clearing debris out so they could get the streets clear. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, you could take a couple thousand guys and each one picks up a rock, that's a couple thousand rocks in the it's, it's a ma matter of mass rather than, than uh, skill and so forth. Mm -hmm. But we would go in, we would, would might be, one time we were, see we, our object was always to make it look like we were doing more than we did. And it was more for our self-satisfaction. I'm sure we didn't have one iota of effect on the war effort. But, one day we were cleaning out a um, bunker that had been, been partially collapsed. And so we were, and of course it was underground, so we were shoveling this stuff up these steps and we had kind of a chain gang sort of thing. And when the guards weren't looking, we were shoving it back down, so, you know, that sort of thing. One day we were on a railroad thing. Germans don't drive their spikes, they screw them in like with a big hand mm -hmm. order. I happened to be in a switching area where there was a whole lot of tracks. And I spent all my working day on four spikes, screwed them in and screwed them out and they wouldn't notice. So I moved about that far in the whole day's effort. It made me feel real good. <laughs> but I, how much good it did. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know. But that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
And then you were also, there were good parts to being worked. It broke up the monotony, and you got a chance sometimes to trade for civilian bread or other things, and also to steal anything you could. And, uh, what did, you, did you have to trade with? Cigarettes primarily, soap sometimes. Uh, cigarettes was a big butter on it. Was, you know, like, and American cigarettes were more valued than the British cigarettes or, or the German cigarettes. Where were we getting the cigarettes from? They would come in parcels. Uh, we got what they call Red Cross parcels, a carton about so mm -hmm. square. And we were supposed to get a parcel a week, that's the Geneva understanding. But usually it was one to six men, that was most common, sometimes one to three. We got a Christmas parcel once that was one to two, and that was great. And that was a little special. The, uh, in fact, I don't think for the American parcels, and the American, Canadian, about five, five countries, can't think of the other ones now. But American, Canadian, British, that was not important, but there are five countries that I know that supply uh, parcels now. Maybe some of the other <coughs> compounds got different ones, I'm sure they did. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but if I hadn't had the items that were in that, I don't think I'd be here. Because I weighed under 100 pounds when I was liberated anyway. So, you know, without those parcels, I, I'm sure I would gone away that some people did, just from malnutrition. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I used to trade cigarettes for uh, vitamins. I used to put uh, C tablets because of the citrus need. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to trade cigarettes and they thought, here, Crazy Jackson, I, I'd get more tablets than I could use because, you know, they, they heard Jackson was giving away cigarettes for C tablets was crazy. <laughs> so anyway, I, that, and I didn't smoke initially. I didn't start smoking until just maybe a month or two before I was liberated. And I limited to three cigarettes a day. Because hmm. there were, and the market fluctuated. I, at one time, like two or three cigarettes would buy you a loaf of civilian bread. Later on, I remember some of pack would get you a loaf of bread. And that's the way it would go. Mm -hmm. But uh, food was very critical. The amount of food they gave us was very limited. We got some boiled potatoes, uh, not every day, but now and then. Once in a while you get a piece of sausage. But the mainstay was a military bread. And you'd get like, uh, it was about so square. And you'd get a, a slab about like that. And you'd get that usually every day, but not <coughs> always. And the difference in the taste of the military loaf and the civilian bread was like night and day. In fact, the military loaf made me sick initially. Hmm. And somebody said, well, sawdust is tough on your inside. <laughs> and I've got a formula in there, which is a joke, but I've got a formula in there for the military loaf, how it's made. Was there uh, much interaction with civilians? <clears throat> uh, well, we did trade. I had a very interesting experience with a blonde one time. I'm trying to trade. So I had some tea bags. I had a couple of tea bags. And I had a bar of soap. And I'm trying to trade with this, this blonde for bread. She's got bread in an open sack. Like and I'm struggling with the language and the line. And she's letting me go on. And and grinning, I wondered why she laughing at me. Finally, she says, "Why don't you speak English?" She was a London gal that had married a German just before the war and had been there <laughs> since. But she's, you know, except for a little accent, she was speaking English very well. So that sort of thing went on. But I did end up getting bread. <laughs> um, was there any recreational opportunities in the camp? No, I guess early on, I know Ace, Ace had been, he was shot down in Africa, flying for the British. So he'd been in the war a long time. And he said initially, of course, they, and an officer's thing was a little better than the other people, than common GIs. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
And he said they even had access to a small library when he was first prison. And they had a kind of a gymnasium that they worked out in. Well, I don't know. They had a, in our camp, I mean, it was never used, like a recreation center. All it was is a, a room that had a stage like this. And, uh, but I never saw it used. It was, I don't know, they never had any plays in there or anything mm -hmm. that I know. They had some bands that were GIs, and where they got the instruments, I don't know, but, you know, somebody, the Red Cross or somebody mm -hmm. got them to. But they would have these band sessions there with them, but they would be just in a barracks mm -hmm. in one of the areas, or they would be, if it was warm enough, outdoors somewhere. Mm -hmm. but what was the, yeah. what were the relationships between the prisoners? Were they, uh, did they, were they cooperative, were yeah. every man for himself? Yeah, you're all in the same boat, only you, you don't trust anybody. Really? Uh, but we had food stolen, you know, while we were in work detail. You always tried to manage that somebody in your tier didn't go. They were sick legitimately or otherwise. And uh, that was mainly to draw water because we had the two taps. And if you waited all to do it at night, you never get water. So they would draw water during the day and uh, kind of keep an eye on your, your gear. So that was kind of a routine. Mm -hmm. And uh, desperate people do desperate things. And the true nature of individuals, I think, comes out in situations like that. Mm -hmm. And the true natures are always not good. Uh, yet can work the other way, too. Um, what's your general opinion of fellow man after your experience here? Well, I used to really upset people because when I got back I was small town, big hero, so garbage. But people had asked me, what are the Germans like? I said, they're just like you and me. And people had heard the propaganda and just couldn't believe it. But I saw Germans, you know, that were no different from us. Uh, we were sometimes confined in the same air raid shelter with Germans while American bombers were dropping bombs on their home from above. And I saw Germans react real negatively, and I saw other ones defending us. They aren't doing that. That's, you know. Hmm. So, you know, you got the whole gamut. The day I was uh, liberated, or not the day, the suit you think, I actually uh, collapsed with the fever I had. And two of my friends took me to a German home. And this mother and her daughter were, you know, taking me like they were my mother and sister, you know, bathing my head with a cold washcloth mm -hmm. and really concerned. So, you know, it can go anywhere. And I, I think that's universally true. And I've felt this way all during our so-called Cold War. <coughs> I don't think the Russian people are any different than we are. Uh, we got hierarchy that's no better than their hierarchy. <laughs> So I, I, I think people, universally, you know, I'm a photographer now and I've traveled, I've done Africa three times and I've spent time with people all over the world, different nationalities, and I find that universally we're pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Now, um, tell us about liberation. Did you, did you have a sense it was... Yeah, we knew, you know, we... We were pretty much in tune with the war. We had some radios, and uh, which were, of course, not legal. And we got the German propaganda. We used to get written releases from the Germans mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And we used to be able to hear BBC. Well, the BBC broadcasts were for Europeans and Germans and so forth. They really weren't a news agency so much like that. And so their propaganda was loaded. The Germans was loaded. And we'd come to a compromise in the middle, and that was about right. Hmm. And, but we knew from towns, you know, when they talked about towns, we knew that they were favoring the Allies. Of course, there was a big concern during the bulge because the towns reversed at that mm -hmm. point. But... Uh, 
generally we knew pretty much what was going on. And we could actually <coughs> hear, hear the shelling and the bombing raids, we could hear a lot earlier than the shelling. Mm -hmm. But we knew, you know, things were coming to an end. Mm -hmm. And uh, the day, it was a Sunday, I had a lot of things happen on Sunday. I got captured on a Sunday, and this started before that, but I got captured on a Sunday, I was liberated on a Sunday. Our first our big attack was first on Sunday. <laughs> Stuff like that. But uh, the day we were liberated, we were liberated by Patton's outfit, <coughs> Third Army, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, there was a lot of shelling, rifle fire and stuff coming inside of the camp. And you know, you're saying, oh, I'm this close, don't let right. it happen now. So we're all keeping our heads down pretty much. And, uh, Eventually, a tank burst through the, near the front gate. And of course, went crazy then. You know, out in the streets, shouting, and <laughs> guys could hardly move move the tank through through the through the area. There was only one main gate to this whole camp. Right? All the entrances and exits were made at that point. Mm -hmm. But third day, I think it was May first, Patton came in. In a jeep, pearl hand pistol, shiny gun, and dressed in all. I think he was a soldier, soldier, really. In fact, if they hadn't cut his gasoline ration, we probably never had a divided Berlin. And I think the war would have been short in, in other areas, too. But I guess they held him in, in tow by not issuing his gasoline. What, um, Logistically, uh, how did it work being liberated? Uh, all right, there you're, oh, a tank comes in the front yeah. gate. Right. What well, happens now? Well, a lot of guys ran out of camp. You know, I guess the surrounding area was loaded with prison, ex-prisoner of war. Uh -huh. But then the uh, Americans put actually more guards around us than the Germans had. Because actually we'd have been a nuisance, you know, and would have slowed up the traffic and everything, and people could have been killed. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, there was a lot of guys that did some pretty bad things, I guess, in town and stuff after after that point. But they, they tried to confine it. Several of us went out of camp later, and it was even possible to get out even with the additional American troops, because mm -hmm. those guys were, were unfriendly. <laughs> they, they, they kind of closed one eye when went past them, but uh, they didn't want a lot of us just on the highways and cluttering up and creating other problems, I'm sure. Food started coming quickly? Fairly quickly, you know. I remember the day I had my first slice of white bread, you know, and stuff like that. And we had nothing fancy because, of course, it was still GI rations, but boy, that was so much better than we had. The day we got out of camp, we went to an artillery unit that was set up, and they fed us, and then all of us got sick, of course, mm -hmm. couldn't handle the food. Stupid, we, we knew it, and yet we did it. But, and they loaded us down with stuff and took back to the camp. Mm -hmm. and I imagine this was kind of happening all around. What, um, when did they start processing you out of the camp? Well, of course, it was hurry up and wait, right. which is a common occurrence in the service. But I can't remember the day sequence, but we were all ready to go, you know. Uh, I had been feeling not so hot, and uh, but they were taking units out each day, we knew that. If it wasn't your unit, you were really disappointed because you went out as a group. And finally, our turn came and they trucked us to Landshot, which is a town north, town north of me where they had a, just a small airport. Uh, it wasn't even a paid airport. Hmm. And uh, they were, when I was, that was when I passed out and took me to this German house and some guys came and got me and took me to a field hospital. And this field hospital was set up right near the runway. 
-hmm. And these are just tents with roll-up sides. So we saw a sight that I'll never forget, and that was much of the Germans surrendering that had access to airplanes. Junker planes, fighter planes, anything that would fly, that they could get their hands, they'd load all their family and could into it. And then they landed there. And it was so chaotic because all these planes were trying to land, but sometimes they were crashing into each other. So the Americans were controlling their landing by firing machine guns on them so they couldn't land mm -hmm. until, you know, it was organized enough to do it safely. So we saw dozens of planes come in. There. The uh, orderlies in our tent rolled up the side curtains, and here we are looking right out at this. And you know, I never thought later that could have been crazy dangerous because we were close enough the plane veered off 100 yards and <laughs> he'd come right into our tent. But we were so excited and watching this, never thought of that. Now these were mainly the, the, the people who wanted to be captured by the Americans, As not the Russians. The Russians, yeah, they were coming from higher from level, these, all kinds. You know, yeah, I couldn't tell. You mm -hmm. just see these these planes land, and then the doors would open, and they'd start coming out. And you know, all kinds of people, mm -hmm. kids, women, you know, men, whatever. So they were evidently loading up all their friends that they could, and were taken off from some field. Probably uh, airfield in the east somewhere, mm -hmm. coming to surrender to the Americans. Uh, when did you leave this uh, <coughs> this camp? Well, I was I was flown out. Well, let's see, within a day, I think it was the next day. Because uh, they were, we were, they were trying to fly us out from this. This had been an area where they'd assembled people that were that were wounded or whatever. And uh, they were flying them out on C-47 stretcher planes. They were just 47s that were converted to stretcher. And they couldn't take off because of these German planes coming in. So finally that got straightened around. So the next morning I flew out on 47. They flew me to a hospital in France near Reims. And I was in this, they couldn't find out what was wrong with me. Thought I had malaria and I didn't test what I ended up, they found I had African sandfly fever, which is kind of like malaria, but doesn't have the same re reoccurrence and so on. So once they discovered that, some smart doctor finally asked me, where have you been? What countries have you been? And I said, well, you know, I told him I landed in Africa. I saw lights in his eyes, and within, within the next day they had me dying. And then treated, and I got over it and hurt. But anyway, the uh, I went from there. They gave me my own travel papers, and I traveled from near Reims <coughs> to Lahar, where they had what they call lucky strike disembarkation, kind of a collective center. And from there, people mostly shipped out and then fly out shipped out. Some got slow ships back to the States. I got a seven day air. I was lucky. And was there anything in particular that you wanted to do that you'd been thinking about for a long time once you got out of the prison camp? Eat. Eat. <laughs> no, I of course was anxious to see my family. Mm -hmm. And I had been engaged just before I went overseas and hadn't seen my fiance and friends. In fact, I, let's see, April 29th, I think, or it was the day we were liberated, I think it was the 26th or somewhere around that time I got my first letters from her. And after, you know, she'd written every day mm -hmm. and everything. So that was, you know, good and I hadn't, in fact, I didn't know she'd moved. I was going to pull a big surprise. I went from, let's see, I can't remember the series of places we came in. We landed in New York, of course, and I think we were taken to New Jersey, and then eventually uh, allowed to go home from there. <clears throat> so I was going to pull a big surprise and, and appear mm -hmm. suddenly. So I got to Syracuse like 5.30 in the morning, and went to where she used to live, and knocked on the door, and her landlady came. It was kind of 
dubious, opened the door, this scroungy looking guy. And finally she recognized my voice and let me in and so forth. And turns Irene had moved. And I didn't know it. <laughs> so the joke was on me, it was a surprise. But she insisted I have breakfast because I looked kind of skinny. And then she insisted on driving me across town to where Irene had moved. So that was a surprise to her. During uh, your time as a prisoner of war, ever consider escaping, or was that just wasn't uh, practical? I was in the escape unit. I mean, I helped to organize. I really, I had no second language. Even if you had a second language in something else, French or Spanish, or didn't have to be German. You know, it was a big help. But a single language speaking person seldom got very far. Uh, even with clothes and some, you know, our documentation wasn't like Hogan's Heroes. We couldn't do as good a job as they did. And, uh, but, you know, some of the stuff we did was, was fairly good. But it was usually from an authentic document that we doctored up. Not mm -hmm. some, we didn't have cameras and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. But I had a map, in fact, I have it with me, that we used to do tracings. It was an old, old map, but it had a lot of detail in it. And except maybe for size of towns and some newer roads, it was very reliable. Mm. So we used to use that for tracing for people that were making a legitimate <coughs> escape. The rules of the camp were, there was organization. It wasn't written and posted like, you know, you find it in a regular place. But there were, there were rules. If you wanted to escape and you were legitimately honest about it, then the street unit would help you. They would, you know, get your maps and get you some concentrated types of food, stuff you could carry without it being bulky, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But if you're just doing it for a lark, and some guys did, uh, the escape committee wouldn't work for you. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, in there. And I have an idea of the same thing that existed in the British compound and Canadian compound and so forth. Many people try? Yeah, quite a few, I think. What was the we success rate? Not high. I only know one person truly escaped. And uh, I think he was from Yonkers, Tony. And he was the one that traded identity with the compound. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, you know, I've always said I have no complaints on you, and that's the way I feel about it. Looking back at your service experience, uh, any general thoughts or sum it up? Well, I don't know. I would not make a good soldier today because it's too much political. You know, I. World War II, and I can't speak for any of it, but, you know, it was a, who was your enemy you knew, and you knew basically where you stood, and the rules of war were kind of somewhat followed, if there is any such thing. But subsequent battles and non-wars that we've had are, are so ill-defined that I would find it hard to, mm -hmm. to do. And so I understand, I didn't initially. I remember at one time I was kind of a hawk in terms of discussing this, because this became a big issue in our church. And I, uh, I remember I was sitting in sessions with our ministers, and they were both on the other side of the issue. And <laughs> now I find myself on that same side. Hmm. Change that way. Now uh, you got home. What's the first thing you did when you got home? Well, I, you know, started, decided I did want to go to college, but it was around time to, to start because I was discharged in November. And I possibly could have picked up in January, <coughs> but I wasn't sure where I was going to go at first. Mm -hmm. And so finally, I had decided I would go, and I decided I wanted to be veterinarian. And, uh, but I couldn't get into that college at that point. 
So I went into a major as a health and physical education person because the, <coughs> the basic programs have a lot of science right. and uh, general, general ed. So that's what I started. And after two years, I applied to Cornell for veterinary medicine. But didn't make it. <laughs> Where'd you go to school first? Rockford. Rockford. That, that's where I ended up graduating from. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. ended up being a teacher administrator for 30 years. So. And no regrets on that either. Know anybody, know any people who went to Samson? Uh, yeah, personally, I knew some people. Cause it was, uh, of course, a base here in New York State. And, uh, in fact, some of the Samson barracks ended up on college campuses. Really? As housing units. Yeah. Okay. Um, you had uh, something to show us? Sure. If you want to see it. Sure, I'd love yep. to. <laughs> this is the old map I talked about, the tracing. And oh. it really is an old timer. Uh huh. Back to 1801. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's well, marvelous. Where did you find the map? In a house. And we, you know, liberated it. Okay. But it really is old and it's. On oh, cloth backing, so right. That's marvelous. But we use this for tracings and. The what did you keep your, um, your log diary, book? Log book on. Oh, it's the. Uh, let's see. That was came. They were distributed. I don't know how many. I never saw another one, but mm -hmm. there could have been more. They were distributed in camp to the uh, YMCA, the National YMCA through Geneva, Switzerland. As, as actual log? As, yeah. Uh, okay. In fact, that's what it's entitled. Because we have um, in our collection a fellow's log diary, and it's done on the, on the back of cigarette wrappers. Oh. Well, I wrote on anything and everything until I got this book. Mm -hmm. I don't know where to, I guess I can probably do it. I don't know how much of it you want to see. Oh, yeah, I oh, let's zoom right in on it. <coughs> yeah, no. so, this is. Uh, let me get this out of the way. There. I can stop this. Uh, that works? Yeah. This is, of course, my great <laughs> basic training. training. Oh, you're Fort McClellan? Yeah. Here I am on KT. Uh -huh. I'm really fat. But that's the, this is the notice of my uh, missing in action, MIA. And this is the notice, uh, these are the actual documents mm -hmm. uh, of my uh, being a prisoner instead so of just missing. That's my engagement picture with Irene. This is the 34th Division. This flag here goes with that thing. And this is a lot of letters I wrote to her. My GI dog pack. <laughs> a couple things missing because they're out because I used them in the book. This is uh, okay. There's my German dog tag. That's where the map goes. Mm -hmm. This is an aerial photo of the POW camp, taken April 9, 45. There's our engagement picture again. These are, uh, this is a letter I wrote to her. That was a type of form they could use. And here is a type of form they could use to write to me. Okay. And also you could use, you know, regular. And then this is another type of form. And this is a other, like a You did write on everything. Yeah. Very nice. We were limited. Um, how many of those we could get, so you didn't net waste them. This is a map of prison camps in Germany, actually also in uh, Czechoslovakia. Okay, and you were where? Russia. Pardon? You were where? Stalag with 7A is down here in the southern part. Ah. Right there. There's New Street. Hmm. This is a photocopy of a honey spread we got in a Christmas particle produced in Groton, New York, where I was born. Huh. There's a one-room school I talked about. Uh -huh. 
That's our farm home. Nice. It's a great. I one. have this. I spoke to the Groton Historical Society, oh. and of course, this thing had meaning. So I had made these up for that purpose. <laughs> now, some of it's changed. Maybe. You got your first letter when? Oh, just before in uh, in April. Okay. And uh, it's a marvelous grouping. This is the 34th division. Right. You could hold that out flat. Oh, I'm so on it. Hard luck division. Yeah, they have more combat line time than any other. Really. Uh, okay, got it. Was uh, not a uh, <laughs> great thing to be known for. <laughs> well, we got a little paper. Oh, I just ran out of ink. Oh, well. Okay, well, thank you, sir. Well, you're welcome.